Uh, Hayden, you've worked in private wealth on a global basis, and then more recently in Australia. I think that makes you a perfect candidate to explain how the private wealth business and, of course, how families and family offices work differently in Australia from elsewhere. Yeah, I think one of the things, Andrew, I've noticed um, about living abroad and coming back to Australia, and I came back here in July 2016, yeah. um, is the unsophisticated nature of, of how, we, how we manage wealth in Australia. I think that's for a variety of reasons. I think the, the clear reason for me is, is the lack of education around asset classes. Um, my contention is that's happened for two main reasons. Uh, one, because we've got an over-reliance on, on, on the equities market, yeah. uh, but also uh, because of uh, interest rates. Uh, if you look at over the last 30 years and you were to amortise those interest rates, it would be around 5 or 6%. So why not put your money in cash? So typically I've found that most people have a, a good understanding of cash instruments and, and, and equities and not much else. And so beyond that, uh, I mean, and, and what about real estate? I suppose real estate is one of those things that people... <coughs> They either inherit or they, they buy, and because Australia is obsessed with real estate, that, that can also be a bit of a false friend, can't it? Because people can make money out of real estate by being lucky rather than clever. Uh, yeah, yeah, true. It, um, I think if I was to put real estate alongside all the other asset classes, I think the most, uh, or the key thing that I think is probably missing today is, is, the, is the theory around risk-adjusted returns, which means investing for the long term and yeah. trying to take away volatility. Yeah, pricing, that is, for, for pricing for risk, basically. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah. And understanding volatility and understanding yeah. when wealthy people invest, and I guess this is a, a key differentiation between overseas and Australia, uh, managing over the long term is also about managing volatility. So it's um, knowing actually how much I'm risking when I actually put money into yeah. something, into so, an asset class. So the, probably the biggest problem with this lack of sophistication is a lack of an understanding of risk, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. And so if you were to sit someone down, for example, and explain to someone the differences between, say, uh, equities and bonds or fixed income versus equities as an asset class, um, and it, who would get paid first in a, in a liquidation of that company, mm. I think you'd be a lot of people would be very um, concerned about where they're putting their money You mean they today. discover what, the, what an ordinary share actually means? Correct. Yeah. That's um, right. <clears throat> yeah. No, it's, a, it, it's an interesting one. But coming back to what you were talking about with the lack of sophistication, I mean, I think you've worked in uh, most recently in Hong Kong, Singapore. You know, there's obviously an Asian mindset, very strong emphasis on family, but no doubt a very strong emphasis on explaining to children, probably from a fairly early age, <clears throat> how the world is. And uh, would you say that's rather, rather less common in Australia? I would say so. I was lucky enough to spend some time um, studying abroad, also Switzerland, uh, uh, Singapore and, and the US. Um, and that's, uh, if I look at what kids are taught there at school, um, on basic concepts to manage money, a lot of that is not taught in Australian schools. Yeah, the, I, I would assume that even if they're taught economics in an Australian school, and that there's not a whole heap of that, that it's probably... Uh, it, it probably wouldn't cover off on the, the more day-to-day -day mundane elements of economics, like interest rates, etc. And, and so, with the best will in the world, the school system's not really adding much value, is it? I don't believe so today, and I think that's what needs to change. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose the, as we sit around this table, we're, we're saying, well, how can, <coughs> we, how can we teach people, young people, to... Um, to have a better understanding of investment than they, than they do now. And I mean, in Australia, I take it most young people are, are extremely reluctant to believe anything their parents tell them anyway. And that, that's, that's not exactly a shining start. But there's also, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming that not every young person whose parents have worked very hard and built up a really good business wants to get into that business. That, that creates a few complications, doesn't it? That's a common theme that we see with, um, or that I, should I say, I've seen across family offices or very um, ultra high net wealth individuals, is sometimes they make the assumption that their children or, or, or child wants to get into the business. Um, typically, for example, what you see today is a lot of the children of these wealthier families um, are probably not as interested going the family interest, uh, going down the family business, but actually going down the, the technology route. 
Yes. Um, and it may be the existing business with a, a technology uh, part to that, yeah. but there's certainly much more of a, a technology angle. And that technology angle could be in artificial intelligence, yeah. robotics, a number of different key themes. And I take it that leaves a gulf between <coughs> the parents and the children, because in many cases, the parents have made a very substantial fortune by making, making a product, doing something with their hands, doing something very physical uh, or, or, or retail, whatever, but not particularly technology focused. So if they've got a 22-year-old, 25-year-old <coughs> son or daughter talking about artificial intelligence, do they pick that up? Do the parents pick that up? Sometimes it's hard. I mean, there's, there's two things here. One is the parents uh, want their child to obviously do well in the future, um, but the distinct lack of um, knowledge around technology themselves makes it hard to invest in your own child as well. So that the child will quite often see technology themes that really the second generation does not have any chance of understanding. Yeah. Um, so that's a challenge. So <coughs> in a way you can understand these children are trying to add to the parents' store of knowledge uh, with their store of knowledge, but sometimes there's not a particularly good congruence, good fit between the two. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, you know, families are lucky enough that the second generation or that the children do want to yeah. pick up the business and run with it, but the key difference today in today's world is, is the technology piece. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's, it's a disconnect yeah. um, because technology is changing yeah. so much. Um, we haven't talked about mentoring <coughs> because clearly we, we, we've been talking about this lack of sophistication. Is there any way that the mentoring can be, can be managed in, in a culture like Australia's where somebody who's done, who is, is a trusted, trusted by the family, by the parents, talking to the children. I, I remember the, the story of uh, Ren, the late Rene Rivkin. Um, I think uh, Kerry Packer said to Rene Rivkin, I want, you, I, I want you to get my son James to invest and I want, him, I want you to lose him some money. <coughs> and Rivkin being Rivkin really struggled with that concept. It, the mentoring is difficult, isn't it? It is because it's about that store of knowledge that you spoke about before. Um, you've got to make sure that the knowledge that you're passing on to your child um, allows them to understand money, wealth, what yeah. that means and how that can possibly yeah. change in the future. Um, so that, that example is probably a good example of yeah. finding out how we can lose money yes. um, to understand why, why money is important and what he should avoid in the future. And it reminds me of Alan Cameron who used to run uh, the, uh, the ASC as it was called <coughs> then. His definition of a sophisticated investor was somebody who'd lost money. Wow. I, I quite like yeah, that actually. Yeah. But yeah so, no, no, it's, it's an interesting topic. Um, and uh, I, I would say that how do you see Australia in 10 years' time on this topic? Look, I, I think it's getting better, and I think schools are, are becoming aware of the need to improve financial literacy. Um, but I, I think it's a long way from where it needs to be. So, Australian. Uh, what I'd like to see or between now and the next 10 years is us explaining more of the nuances around finance, the nuances I mean to, to Australia. Yeah. For example, franking, negative gearing, um, why, uh, why it's good to buy a hybrid as, as opposed to buy a bond, actually breaking those elements down. Um, that, those are the sorts of things I'd like to think that we can get to in 10 years. Yeah, and that advice can come from all sorts of different, different places because I mean, would you also say that there's some very successful business people in Australia who are probably very poorly equipped to explain some of the nuances of the financial world to their own children? That's, I do find that. Yeah. Um, without, I, without asking for any names. No, um, it is common to come across very wealthy families. And when I say very wealthy, I mean people north of their net wealth being more than $100 million. And the way that they've structured themselves to invest is really in keeping with what they've done in their company. But yeah. when you look at a company where they've probably made most of their wealth, yeah. typically what they do is they forget to put a Chinese wall between them and their wealth. So yeah. what happens is their company and the people, the secretaries, the operations manager, the CFO, end up running the money for them. Yes, um, <clears throat> That's a common mistake yes. uh, that I see. Those families who are, uh, who are, are able to put that wall and, and segregate to two defined businesses tend to be most successful. Um, when you keep it all together, that's where you, you make mistakes. Yeah. Uh, for mine, you, you have people 
either receiving advice or, or being giving advice or making suggestions who really aren't qualified in that area to do so. And also, if you've got, if you've got this entrepreneur who's done extremely well, they reach retirement age and their money's been being managed by the people working for them and they perhaps looking to sell out or perhaps the, 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 their children don't want to take on and there's a, there's a complication there. You're saying that if this entrepreneur is, has failed to make that differentiation, it, it brings all sorts of disaster crashing down if the entrepreneur and the business go in different directions. Correct, because it's, it's, it's personal to you. Yeah. Your welfare, your company's still personal to you because you started perhaps or yeah. you, in, you inherited that business. But if you don't delineate between your own personal wealth and your company, it be, you end up running your company on your own balance sheet. And that's in Australian terms not the way to do it either um, from a personal um, let's say from a company perspective, there aren't advantages to doing that anyway. Well, it might also be that that entrepreneur has made a lot of money out of the <coughs> business that may, may not actually provide a lot of growth in the future, but because they've been really good at it, they don't want to let go. And the psychology must be... Like the, the, the psychology is hard, and that's why the, the succession planning element of bringing in the son or daughter is j just as important. Um, it's really important, I think, to look top down first in terms of... Uh, getting clear segregation between the company and your own yeah. money um, and then who in the future you you, you may yeah. end up running that money. People always tend to, and there's a bit of a, I guess, a misunderstanding or, or I guess that it always has to be the oldest son. Yeah. It's not the oldest son who sometimes has the knowledge, um, the patience, the ability to manage the wealthy, you know, to manage the wealth and affairs. Yeah, it's interesting. Isn't it? um, you have to, you have to find out who's prepared who is the most judicious, who is the one who will be able to um, be independent, yes. um, who they m marry or, or don't marry in the future, who their partner is. There's a lot of considerations. Sounds absolutely fascinating. I think we should actually carry on all day, but we better wind it up there. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Appreciate it.